OK, this is my final PowerPoint on theme 2D. We've uh, looked at the life of Martin Luther. We've looked at the Council of Trent. And now we're going to look specifically at uh, this concept of faith and works and how this is portrayed in the Bible. So let's just recap over Luther's theology. Remember, he believed that you came to justification sola fide, by faith alone. Um, we're clear that justification in Christian theology is how God removes guilt and penalty of sin and makes everyone clean, righteous again, and that is done through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we know that Luther believed that God justifies through faith in Christ. Humans don't deserve this. They can contribute nothing to their salvation, so therefore there's no point in doing works. It is just a gift from God. And Luther believed that God declares a sinner justified. Um, this phrase uh, is known as forensic justification, comes from the Roman word forum, which was a court of law. And so basically it's, it's a legal exchange. We receive Jesus's righteousness. In exchange, our sins are taken away. He bore them for us on the cross. So Luther believed that our righteousness is an alien righteousness. It, it, it isn't part of us. It is from outside us. It belongs to Jesus because Jesus is the only one who is sinless. But because of our union with Jesus through faith, via baptism, God imputes. He gives us this righteousness so we are able to have a relationship with him. Now, some people refer to this um, as a legal fiction. Now, legal fiction is something that's assumed in law to be fact, irrespective of the truth or accuracy of that assumption. And what I mean by this is that it's all very well Luther saying, oh, well, you know, we just our sins are washed away. But actually, is that a legal fiction? Are we still sinful nevertheless? It's all very well saying it. But does that actually mean that we do become sinless? Does that view make sense? Is it a legal fiction? Surely the reality is that we as humans remain sinful. Well, Protestants would argue that it's not a legal fiction because even though a person is still a sinner on the inside, justification comes from the outside. It's extrinsic. It comes via God's declaration that we are free from sin. We know that we ourselves are sinners. Uh, simul justus et peccata, if you want to use the Latin. We are simultaneously justified whilst at the same time being sinners. Other Protestants say that the person's sins are cancelled by Jesus' death and that we are no longer sinful. So that diagram, in a sense, summarises. Christ's righteousness is credited to us and our guilt is credited to Jesus on the cross. So we gain the righteousness and the guilt is taken from us by Jesus's death for our sins on the cross. So the only human response to God's gift of justification is faith. For Luther, no works can contribute to salvation and you certainly can't deserve it through works. You can't buy salvation by doing works. For Luther, once saved, you're always saved. Receiving salvation is a one-time event. Nothing can threaten the salvation of those who are destined for a relationship with God because God justifies it. Justifies it. So Luther would argue that a person with justifying faith will by this grace live a repentant life free of serious sin. So what Luther's saying there is if you if you are justified, if you've um, if you've taken God on board, for want of a better word, your life will change. Your life will be one of repentant and you will of repentance and you will be free of serious sin. You are less inclined to sin as a result of your justification. And what Luther would say, that if someone then does sin mortally, then actually that shows they didn't really receive justifying grace. They were mistaken. 
Other Protestants, though, believe that even if they do sin, they still remain saved. So um, opinion is divided within Protestantism on this. Um, certainly without justifying grace, nothing we can do, no good work, can be pleasing to God as we would remain under God's anger, his wrath due to our sinful nature. Going on to the Council of Trent, if we remember, it emphasised that justification is ultimately the free gift of God. It's obvious that no one can expect to be seen as fully righteous before God. Only God can do them the favour of seeing them this way. And this is the grace of justification. But we also need to remember that Trent asserted that justification can be a reward deserved for good works done if these works are done in the grace of God. And that's sort of where we start to part ways with Protestantism. Because God is just and merciful, it would be unjust for God to condemn to hell those who've lived well in cooperation with his grace. Even though no one could actually demand their justification, strictly owing to them and it would remain God's free gift and his decision to give it. Hopefully that makes sense. So we know that Trent denounced the view that human effort alone can deserve justification. That's exactly the same view as the Protestants held. They also denounced the view that human freedom is not important to justification, that humans are incapable of freely performing good acts or keeping God's law and that salvation can be known with certainty and doesn't need to be worked at. But there are some common misunderstandings that A-level students have as regards the Council of Trent, so I'll endeavour to clear some of these up as we go along. So one of the common misunderstandings we have is that Protestants thought that faith, apart from a loving relationship with Christ, can save. Actually, that's wrong. Protestants did not think this. Faith is just, it's not the only thing that can save. You've got to have that loving relationship, okay? Uh, other common mistake that's made is that Catholics thought that justification is obtained by human effort alone. That's wrong. The Catholics of the Council of Trent did not think this. The other common misconception is that Protestants thought that good works were not important in salvation. That again is wrong. They didn't think this. They thought that good works would just be a part and parcel of having a real faith in Christ, but it's not an extra free human contribution to faith and justification. So the good works came as a result of that faith. So let us now look at the Bible and Luther's justification for sola fide, for faith alone. And it depends very much on which books you look at, where you go to decide whether it's faith and works and you as an A-level student need to be aware of these passages. So let's go. So if we start with the Gospels, in John 6, chapters, uh, John chapter 6 verses 28 to 29, we get this. They, then they inquired of Jesus, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus replied, this is working for God to believe in the one he has sent. In other words, to be saved, you only need to believe in Jesus. That would appear to imply sola fide. If we look at the book of Acts, in chapter 16, verse 30, he, the jailer, asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They, the apostles, replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So there, the jailer is not told to do anything else other than believe to be saved. So sola fide. If we then go to the letters of Paul, um, so particularly in the Romans, and there are other others as well, um, but these verses in Romans seem to suggest that we are made right in the sight of God, not by anything we do, but by God's gift to us. So you've got Romans 1.17, the righteous will live by faith. You've got Romans 4.3, uh, what does the scripture say? And Adam, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Um, Romans 5 1 since we've been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ again all these are showing sola fide if we then go to his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 for it's by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it's a gift from God not by works so that no one can boast so in other words nothing we can do can bring us salvation sola fide now 
let's look at the Catholic view of justification. And the Catholic view would be it's a combination, it's faith and works. So justification by faith and works. Justifying faith saves, good works contribute to this alongside such faith. So Catholics are saying that good works on their own cannot deserve justification because that's a gift from God, but they can still be pleasing to God even without faith. Luther studied Augustine extensively and he followed Augustine's view that all salvation comes from God as God's free gift of grace. As we know, grace means God's favour working in us to help us reach salvation. The Catholic view on salvation also comes from St Augustine, so there's a crossover there between Catholicism and Luther. Catholic Church teaches that all salvation is a gift from God and no one can deserve it by their own efforts. So in this sense, there's no difference between Catholics and Protestants. Both believe that every help we have, for example, the inspiration carrying out of good works, which please God, is grace. Grace prepares our hearts to receive faith. Grace gives us faith in God. Grace is given to us freely to do good works in obedience to God, in other words, to cooperate with him. So grace for Augustine is something which is given to us to be part of us, working within us in our free choices, to transform us, to be more Christ-like, to be more like Jesus, and more fit for salvation. It's a cooperative effort. Man's free will choosing good actions. God's grace aiding us. Because we stand in such grace, we must do good works in order to, quoting Philippians here, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now it's at this point that Luther disagrees. He doesn't think we can have grace. Luther believed we're only given an attitude of being in favour with God, which depends on God, and we cannot ever do anything ourselves with the grace we stand in. Only God makes sure we do everything we need to in terms of good works, according to the faith he's given us. So in Catholic theology, being saved or justified isn't an all or nothing situation, as in being declared righteousness, the Protestant view, so that God says, you know, we're righteous, we're forever saved. Catholics don't go with that. Rather, what they would say, we're given the task of becoming righteous in God's eyes with the help of his grace. And that's why doing good works and avoiding sin is so important. And again, let's quote that Philippians, work out your salvation, in fear and trembling. So this involves our free choices as well as God's grace. So while Protestants emphasise God's free grace and what God does for us, Catholics also point to the importance of our free choices in cooperating with God's work of transforming us to be more like Christ. And if you know your theodicies, you can look at your um, uh, soul um, making theodicies, if you want your Irenaean theodicy, which is sort of linked to this in some ways. So uh, your Catholic view, a mortal sin can make you lose the grace of justification you receive through baptism in professing faith in Christ. But the sacrament of penance can enable this grace to be restored. For a Protestant, this would be impossible, since once saved, always saved. So by doing good deeds, Catholics would argue, we cooperate with God's saving grace and become really transformed to be more like Christ. We're not just declared righteous and bosh, that's it. Because of God's grace working in us, something Luther doesn't believe in, we actually can freely do the kinds of good deeds that will contribute to our salvation. In other words, to Philippians, work out our salvation. We make sure that our faith is really a justifying faith, not just God. So is there Bible evidence for faith and works, this Catholic view? Well, yes, there is. If you look at the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, 
Abraham has his faith tested by God when he had to sacrifice his son Isaac. Paul writes that Abraham was justified by faith, i.e. God saw him as being just and righteous because of his faith. But Abraham wasn't praised just for his faith. He was praised for his obedient action in tying up his son and being prepared to sacrifice him. So this proves that his action secured his faith as being justified. Without this, he wouldn't have been declared justified. His faith on his own didn't make him justified. And that's also linked to the arguments in the book of James. In the Gospels, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, when a rich man, which young man asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Um, Jesus replied, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. But if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Now, there is a distinct command to actually do something works. Go, sell, give to the poor. Jesus expects us to do the good works of keeping the commandments as a basic requirement. But following him is the perfection. And if we look at the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, uh, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me, come receive the kingdom. So that's the implication that serving others brings you into a relationship with Christ. Even if you don't have faith, you'll be rewarded with salvation. So faith and works. And of course, obviously, you've got the whole of the letter of James, which Luther dismisses out of hand. And that's concerned with obedience and what we must do to be saved. James also says that Abraham was not saved by faith alone, but by his obedience. So the doctrine of sola fide would be a false doctrine. James asks, if someone has faith but no deeds, can that faith save him? Well, he's not assuming that such a faith automatically leads to good deeds as a sign of being saved, which is the Protestant view. But he's challenging his readers that such deeds are a matter of choice and free will. And without such choices, a person will not be saved. So if you look at James 2.14, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? That's quite a good little quote I'd have in the back of my uh, locker for the exam. Or you can have this one. Faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action is dead. Or you can have faith without deeds is dead. So James definitely saying you need faith and works. And Paul also backs this up in his letter to the Philippians. Again, I've quoted this a few times, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So that's sort of saying, even though you may have an assurance you've been saved, you need to live in such a way as to confirm this assurance, living out uh, of a correct belief and doing good works in the sight of God's judgment. Now, where does this all leave us? Well, you need to know for this part of the course, the work of one biblical scholar, and that is E.P. Sanders. And he interprets Paul's letters in a different way. And his argument is that actually Luther's argument against faith and works is actually false. Luther has misinterpreted what Paul is writing. So you have to know E.P. Sanders. I'm going to take you through him now. Hopefully this will make sense. So Sanders is an American New Testament scholar. He's a principal proponent of a new perspective on St. Paul. He's a, an expert on St. Paul, major scholar in the scholarship of the historical Jesus. And he contributed to the view that Jesus was part of a renewal movement with, within Judaism. That is not so important in terms of the exam, but it's what he said about faith and works that you really need to get your head around. So, Sanders argues the following. He says, if you look at the letters of Paul, Paul's strongly suggesting that believers should avoid any hint of doing works as a way of winning salvation. That's really clear. And Protestants, and particularly Luther, use these quotes to argue that works cannot lead to salvation. But Sanders says, when Paul is referring to works, we need to be really clear what he actually means. What were these works? What was he really against 
these good works, you know. So when he's having a pop at people doing good works, what works was he meaning? What specific things? And in his book, Paul and Palestine Judaism, Sanders tackles the question of this. What works was Paul against? And this is how he sees it. He says, you put it into context. Paul was writing to new Christians who were confused about whether or not they should be following Jewish practices and following Jewish laws. Let's not forget, Jesus and all his apostles were Jewish. Paul himself was Jewish. So as this new branch, this new religion, this new sect of Judaism, whatever you want to call it, started in the first century, did the new Christian converts have to imitate Jews in order to take on the new religion? So did they have to keep kosher? Did they have to avoid certain foods such as shellfish and pork? Did they have to be circumcised? And it's quite clear that there is an argument in Acts between the Jerusalem church led by Peter and James and some of the Gentile churches that were being founded by Paul. Certainly the Jerusalem church is much more strict in adhering to some of the old Jewish customs, whereas Paul, out in Greece, Turkey, Asia Minor, etc., is converting Gentiles to the new religion. And to be quite honest, it's not exactly a winner if you convert someone to a new religion and say, oh, by the way, in order to join this new religion, you've got to give up eating pork, you can't eat meat and milk together in the same meal, you can't have shellfish, oh, incidentally, we require all males to be circumcised. So Paul is very clear that the new converts to Christianity do not have to stand by the old Jewish practices. In fact, what he's saying is that by doing this would undermine the whole fact that Jesus is the one through whom we are saved, not by keeping kosher, observing the Sabbath, um, being circumcised, that doesn't save someone, faith in Jesus does. So when Paul is referring to works, he is referring to the Jewish practices that were a way of showing Jewish identity, that a person belonged to the old Jewish religion, the covenant with Moses, whereby God sets out a load of laws that have to be obeyed, and through obedience to the law, God is your chosen, um, God will protect you, you are his chosen people. That is the old Mosaic law, the legalistic works of the Jewish religion. And it's those works that Paul is referring to. He is not referring to good works, giving to charity, that sort of stuff. He's referring to the works that are things like not cutting the hair by the side of your head, uh, which is a, um, an indication of Judaism, uh, keeping kosher, being circumcised. It's those works that have a specific Jewish identity that Paul is referring to. And Sanders calls this covenantal nomism. Nomos is the Greek for law, so legal covenant. For Paul, the old covenant between uh, God and his chosen people, the law, uh, the Jews, whereby they obey his law and as a result of that he's their God, has gone. There's a new covenant in Jesus. So the rituals of belonging to the old one, keeping kosher, being circumcised, etc., have gone. And anything that harps back to that is wrong. It's those works that are incorrect. In the new covenant, you only need faith in Jesus. Doing the Jewish works of the law can never bring you into that new covenant and the salvation that it brings. So what we have here is an antinomian doctrine. It's an anti-legalistic doctrine. It's opposed to seeing the law as valuable. That's why Paul is against works. And it's those specific works that link through to the ancient Jewish covenantal nomism that Paul is talking about. So Paul is also having a slight pop that the, you know, the Jews, by doing this, you know, obeying all these rules, were becoming self-righteous and boastful and forgetting that they were part of God's covenant at all and forgetting that covenant was a gift from God to the Jewish people. So what Sanders is saying is Paul's not against doing good works as such. 
In fact, Luther's got totally the wrong end of the stick. He finds no evidence that Paul was actually concerned with the issue of faith as opposed to works. And he thinks that Luther's actually incorrectly read in his own spiritual struggles, seeing them reflected in Paul's writing. So what Sanders is saying is Luther's just got it wrong. He's misinterpreted Paul. He's taken that word works in Paul in his letter to the Romans, etc. And he's not and he's missed the whole point of what Paul is saying. Paul is not against works. He's against specific works that uphold Jewish identity and the old covenant, the old legalistic covenant. Paul, in fact, has a generally positive view as the law of the law as a useful tool in training people to be fit to receive God's salvation. In Romans 3.3, 3, he writes, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. 1 Corinthians 7.19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commandments is what counts. So this would seem to back up Sanders's view. Maybe Luther has got the wrong end of the stick here. If we go to Galatians 5.14, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbour as yourself. So let's summarise this. I've put a little chart together, which hopefully might make it all make sense. So if we take the Protestant view, we have God's grace, which leads to faith, which leads to salvation. Faith can lead to deeds, but the key bit is that deeds cannot lead to salvation. In the Catholic view, grace leads to faith, which can lead to salvation. But at the same time, grace can lead to deeds, which can contribute to and may deserve, but don't strictly merit, salvation, hence my dotted line. And faith can also lead to deeds, and deeds in some way can lead back to faith. So that is it in a nutshell, the two opposing views. So the Catholic view is that deeds are almost like a byproduct of grace and faith and can in some ways lead to salvation. Protestant view, I'm afraid it can't. Hopefully that makes sense.